The idea for the music animation machine came from a hallucination I had in the early 70s while listening to J.S. Bach's Sonatas and Partitas for Unaccompanied Violin. The notes on the page were dancing to the music, but at the same time, they were the music. It was so charming and graceful, the flag of an eighth note extending like a ballet dancer's arm, pairs of notes moving in parallel thirds and sixths like dancers stepping hand in hand. I was delighted. Then, I got out a score of a Brandenburg concerto and put on a recording of it. Unfortunately, as a beginner at reading scores, I couldn't integrate all the separate instrumental parts into a cohesive vision. It was just confusing and frustrating. A few days later, I began wondering whether a complex piece of music could be presented visually in a way that would help a listener follow it. The first thing I tried was a piano reduction, a kind of score in which all the notes of the piece are presented on just two staves, like piano music. Since I'd studied piano, this was somewhat easier for me to read, but I wanted to follow the individual parts. So I tried making the notes for each instrument a different color. This was better, but there wasn't enough color on the page to make it easy to follow a single part, especially when a slow-moving part with just a few long notes was buried under a fast-moving part with lots of notes. The long notes needed to be bigger. This led me to a notation where each note is a bar of color. To show this scroll to somebody, I'd unroll it on the floor, it's about 20 feet long, put the music on the stereo, then I'd walk along beside it, pointing to each measure as it went by, so that the person watching it wouldn't lose their place. A guy I met from Hollywood suggested animating it, and I was at the point of gathering the materials to do a stop-motion animation, when a programmer friend suggested I use a computer instead. So I bought one, and learned how to write software. Since the result was that I had a machine which automatically made the animated scores I'd previously planned to make by hand, I called the program the Music Animation Machine.
In the first version of the software, I had to enter the music by converting it into numbers and typing them in. A single two-minute piece took me about a week to enter, and I swore I'd figure out a better way. Fortunately, MIDI was on the rise, so I built a MIDI interface card and wrote another version of the music animation machine, this time with a performance editor. Since I was the primary intended user of the software, I could make it to suit myself. I'm a pianist and have a lot of neurons dedicated to finding my way around on a piano, so I made the user interface almost completely controllable from a MIDI keyboard, augmented by a trackball, which is on a stand so that I don't have to reach too far for it. At the bottom of the screen in the performance editor, you see a little one-octave keyboard graphic. That's the menu. The black notes are the main categories, like File and Edit. When you press one of those, seven white note subcategories come up. Pressing one of them brings up further subcategories, and so on until you've selected the operation you want. So, all the commands become little licks, which, because I'm a keyboard player, are really easy for me to learn and do fast. There are a, nice, a couple of nice things about this arrangement. For one, the piano has a very distinctive topography, so I can feel where I am without looking. Also, the editor functions can be selected with one hand, leaving the other hand free to work the pointer. So instead of using a pointer to pick an operation from a menu, then moving the pointer to where I want to do that operation, I can point with one hand at the same time I'm picking what to do. This makes it very quick. I can move a note a little in time, change its pitch, uh, change its dynamic level, add some time to the piece, rewind, playback, all very quickly. Once the music animation machine was operational, it was obvious how much was missing from it. You couldn't tell anything about timbre, very little about harmony, not much about rhythm. So I started trying to figure out how to enhance the display. The first thing I experimented with was tonality. The musical interval we call a perfect fifth is the second most fundamental one, the most fundamental being the unison or octave. In Western music, we have ended up with 12 pitches, all related to one another by the interval of the perfect fifth, more or less. On a piano keyboard, these are arranged in order by frequency. I decided instead to try arranging them so that adjacent pitches were a perfect fifth apart. This arrangement is known to musicians as the circle of fifths. Then I applied the color wheel to this circle so that pitches which were closely related by perfect fifths would be close in color. This turned out to be useful for showing things about tonality. For example, all the notes in a major scale are grouped together. This means that if you're playing a piece that stays in one key, it stays in one area of the circle. If the key changes, the notes are in a new area. Also, notes which are not in the key stand out. This same coloring can be applied to the scrolling score. Here's a piece that stays in one harmonic area for a while. Here, in the middle of this piece, the harmony changes more quickly. Of course, there are other intervals besides the perfect fifth, and when a bunch of different pitches are sounding at once, the resulting chord is made up of several different interval types. My friend Michael Dalby had the idea of showing all the different interval types in a chord as a way of visualizing the nature of the chord. In this program, named Dyad, the pitches are arranged around a circle as before, but when you play two notes, a line is drawn between them. The color of the line depends on the interval type. Fourths and fifths, the most consonant intervals, are blue. 
thirds and sixths are green, major seconds and minor sevenths, which are more dissonant, are violet, minor seconds and major sevenths, more dissonant still, are yellow, and the most dissonant interval, the tritone, is red. So, when you play a chord, you see all the intervals that are present. I find that this view helps me see why, for example, a major seventh chord, which has one very dissonant interval in it, sounds fairly consonant, since there are thirds and fifths, which tend to soften the major seventh, while a chord like this, with lots of dissonant intervals in it, sounds so much more harsh. In this variant of dyad, the notes are shown in all their ranges, instead of just one. This allows you to see when the same interval relationships exist in more than one octave. This variant of dyad combines the interval connections with the vertical pitch idea of the music animation machine. Another thing I tried was to show when thirds and fifths, the most consonant intervals, were present in a chord. In this program, notes that are a third or a fifth apart are adjacent. More dissonant intervals either overlap, like the major second, which is the least dissonant interval after the third or fifth, or don't touch at all, like the minor second or the tritone. Although this does show something, I don't think it was a particularly successful experiment. Earlier, I said that the pitches used in Western music were related by the interval of a perfect fifth, more or less. This is something that musicians have been struggling with for a long time. It happens that 12 perfect fifths add up to just a little more than an octave, and three major thirds add up to almost an octave, but not quite. These discrepancies make it impossible to make instruments that can play perfectly in tune in all the different keys. To explore this, I made some software tools for studying intervals and tuning systems. In this program, you hear two pitches and see what happens when they are in various frequency ratios to each other. It turns out that two pitches with small whole number frequency ratios, like 3 to 2, or 5 to 4 sound better together than those with bigger number ratios, like 15 to 16. In this program, the intervals with small whole number ratios are shown and can be compared to the pitches you get when you divide the octave into equal parts. This lets you see why we settled on 12 pitches per octave instead of 11 or 13. And in this program, we can experiment with the kinds of compromise that are necessary in making a 12-pitch tuning system. For each of the 12 pitches, the notes of a major and minor triad built on that pitch are shown. When you change the tuning of a pitch, all the chords which contain that pitch are changed. After you've developed a tuning system using a certain principle you've thought of, you can look through a database of historical tunings and see if there are any that look similar. Usually there are. Although the music animation machine can use color to show which instrument is playing, it can't show what an instrument actually sounds like. To do this, I developed a new kind of spectrogram, one that shows small deviations in pitch and shows the amount of energy in the harmonics of a tone, which determines its timbre. In this display, the pitch of a singer's voice is shown by the white line near the bottom of the colored area. You can see the vibrato. The melody is somewhere over the rainbow. The gray area below the white line shows the amplitude of the fundamental frequency, and the colored areas above the line show the amplitudes of the various harmonics. 
One idea is to have the scrolling music animation machine display, showing the notes of an instrument like the piano that can't vary its tone. Combined with this display, showing the subtleties of pitch and timbre of another instrument, or the human voice. The scrolling score in the music animation machine shows rhythm, sort of, but it doesn't really give you a sense of the rhythm. In this program, I tried doing a Fourier transform of a rhythm. Here's a regular rhythm. As you can see, a pulse waveform contains lots of harmonics. Here's an irregular rhythm. You can see that more energy accumulates in the higher frequencies than in the fundamental. Although this program works the way it ought to, what it shows is not as interesting as I'd hoped. It doesn't show anything about the character of the rhythm. Rhythm is pretty elusive. Although the music animation machine editor is fast, it's not nearly as fast as playing the piece perfectly the first time. Sometimes, though, the notes are just too hard to play expressively at the right tempo. The idea occurred to me, why not separate out the pitches from the act of performing them? I could enter the notes as slowly as I wanted and add the expression later. It turned out that other people had come up with this idea before. It's known in the trade as the conductor program. Christopher Strangio patented it in 1974, and Max Matthews also thought of it and uses it in his radio drum. In the music animation machine implementation of the conductor program, a MIDI keyboard triggers the notes. When you press a key on the keyboard, the next note is played, or in the case of a chord, the next group of notes that starts at the same time. You control the timing, the dynamics, and the pedaling. And the computer controls the pitches. What I like about using a piano keyboard to trigger the notes is that I can do finger patterns that fit the music. It's sort of like the violinist's bow arm being separate from the left hand fingering. It allows better control. Still, there are limitations to this keyboard implementation. For one thing, you have to know the rhythm of the piece perfectly. I thought, what if the conductor program were really more like conducting? So I built a crank that you could turn once a measure, sort of like a hurdy-gurdy. Unfortunately, it turns out to be very hard to turn a crank smoothly enough, and it has another limitation that the keyboard version has. You don't have control of dynamics within a note. For that, I made this mock-up of another interface for the conductor program. I call it the lizard trampoline. The gloves have conductive fingertips so that even a light contact with the metal screen can trigger notes. Plus, pressure on the surface can continuously control the dynamics. And you have multiple areas of control, so you can, for example, swell the wind section on a sustained note while the strings do lighter notes. At some point, I realized that I was getting far away from my original experience, which had to do with the graceful gestures and motions which characterize music. Oscar Fischinger's early black and white films helped remind me what I was after. They have a quality of motion which seems very much like the way music moves. So I did some experiments with flowing motion, which I called Oscarettes. The Oscarettes don't tie motion to music, yet. You have to do it by hand. In my most recent experiments, I've associated different geometrical shapes with different instruments, while keeping some features of the original music animation machine display.